carbon-free electricity and electric cars are the future. It's that combination that makes it sustainable. You have the chance to be part of a revolution in this area and to truly understand how these disruptive and cutting edge technologies are impacting your business, your employees, and your day-to-day -day life. Now, for the few of you in the audience who aren't already familiar with Mike Calise, Mike Calise has been in the clean tech business for over a decade after getting his start at Intel and leading a number of early stage technology startup companies. He went on to found EV Advise, an independent advisory firm focused on mass scale electric vehicle infrastructure. He now directs work on electric vehicles at Schneider Electric, the world's leader in energy efficiency. Mike. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jessica. This is very exciting. I really appreciate uh, everybody showing up today in, in, in really what is Silicon Valley. You know, we call it the epicenter of EV or the center of gravity at EV. There's so much energy in Silicon Valley, and really the technology that starts here is pervasive. We have great businesses from Detroit, great businesses from the global areas uh, to bring uh, technology, to bring uh, vehicle transportation, to be electri electrified in the future. This is a really exciting time. So let's thank the Silicon Valley Leadership Group and the Bay Area Climate Council. Uh, thank SAP for opening the wonderful doors to everybody in the community. And certainly let's not uh, forget to thank Tesla for being, for being Tesla. Okay. <laughs> um, it's been a productive year for EV. It's, um, you know, uh, like the mayor said, we see vehicles everywhere. But those of you who are visiting from out of town, you see a lot more EVs here than probably everywhere. And this is the, just the start, really. Um, but the business is not uh, without its challenges, right? And we all know that some companies didn't succeed this year. But what we do know is this. This industry will not be defined by the success or failure of one model, the success or failure of one company. And it really has uh, a profile that we have to look uh, toward uh, that is a long-range success profile. So what's great is we're seeing many people uh, even do things like um, share vehicles now, right? So BMW's got a great car sharing program. It's not without its challenges, but we're learning as we're doing, and we're seeing great business models being created. And that's the key to electric vehicles. It's not about charging cars. Uh, in many ways it is, but you can see that it's the business models that we've never really even thought about that are before us, and they're changing. You know, I drive to the airport, I drive home in the LEAF, and the airport pays for my drive home. So I feel like I, I actually didn't just get free miles, but they actually paid me, and I did the math, and it was something like $16 uh, off my normal parking fee. And you think about those business models, and you're seeing a transformation in business models, and this is what will carry the industry forward. Um, last year, uh, many of you heard, for those of you who were here, uh, Schneider Electric created a framework in which to think about the EV market adoption. And we made it simple, called the nine inning ball game. And what this really was, was uh, a way to frame your thinking about uh, the adoption of EVs. So in the first three innings, and if we call 2011 the sort of year zero, then we look at 2012, 13, and 14, the first, you can see that it's still the EV ready period. We're still putting infrastructure out in advance of EV adoption. And if you think about it, driver anxiety is high, utility anxiety is relatively low. If you then look at the next three year period, we call that the EV willing period, where people see the charging infrastructure out there and are now willing to make an EV purchase decision. So it's not just the simple chicken and egg we talked about. Now that, at that point, driver anxiety decreases, but utility anxiety starts to rise a little bit. And then if you look at the last three innings of the game, or three year period, uh, 18, 19, and 20 inclusive, 2018, 19, and 20, that's when we're in the EV able period. And that's when you're able to charge everywhere without thinking. And that's when driver anxiety basically goes away. But utility anxiety is pretty, it's pretty high. Just a framework 
in, uh, in which to, to look at market adoption and market deployment. And now, of course, um, we've done a lot of work here, and we've all been asked numerous times, when will EVs become mainstream? When will they get out of the early adoption mode? When will we cross the chasm? And we're using this word chasm as, you know, we, we, it's all within us, and it has nothing to do with a sort of rock formation in Utah. <laughs> and so, really, uh, what are the biggest hurdles to success? And how do we even define success? And what better way to get those questions answered than by the man himself? So Jeffrey Moore is a world-renowned author of Crossing the Chasm, maybe the single most influential book for Silicon Valley's history of successful and failed technology ventures. So many of the world's influential leaders and individual contributors dove into those books as they were setting their company strategies. And whether it was Crossing the Chasm, my personal favorite, dealing with Darwin, Inside the Tornado, The Gorilla Game, uh, the uh, Living on the Fault Line, and the recent uh, release, Escape Velocity. It's a great read. Uh, it's about big companies, how they incubate small companies within them, which is uh, quite relevant to many of the companies here. Jeff continues to be the managing director of Jeffrey Moore Consulting. He's a venture partner at Moore David Al Ventures. He's also a key business advisor to high-tech companies like Cisco, HP, Microsoft, Yahoo, SAP, and Schneider Electric. As a renowned expert, this industry will draw from his expertise and help us navigate our strategies. And whether you're from business or government, you're going to look at how these strategies overlay, which are quite relevant for the technology lifecycle adoption curves and our nine inning ball game. So without further ado, on behalf of Schneider Electric, we're proud to have the opportunity to sponsor this year's Driving Charge and Connected keynote address. Let's give a warm welcome for an influential business icon and a consummate gentleman, Mr. Jeffrey Moore. So as Mike said, look, we're in the middle of a pretty classic technology adoption life cycle situation. And I wanted to share with you some ideas that have been kind of getting refreshed as we go along. We're, we're kind of in our third decade of working with disruptive innovation models. And surprisingly, we've actually learned a few things, which is kind of fun. Um, in particular, what happened in the last decade was there was a lot of technology that came roaring into the market that didn't seem to have anything to do with the chasm model. So Google, FaceTime, Instagram, like we don't need no stinking chasms, right? We just need. And so the question became, how do you, how do you kind of decide between taking a B2B point of view, which is still the classic chasm crossing point of view, or a B2C point of view. And, and there's this sort of this Robert Frost idea that you, know, you have to sort of make these fateful decisions in life. But I think in this situation right now, that's not what we're going to do. That what we have to do is, in fact, take a two-pronged approach. That we're going to actually apply both models. So all I want to do this morning is I want to sort of remind you of the model, the classic chasm across the uh, model, and sort of tee up what decisions institutions have to make. And as Mike was saying, at the beginning of this thing, the institution risk is low, but it's going to increase. And so as we solicit the support of institutions, the B2B chasm crossing model will be very important. At the same time, we need to build consumer enthusiasm for, for the electric vehicle. That's the driver anxiety that we're trying to reduce. That's going to be more of the B2C model. And whether you're public policy or whether you're a marketing uh, uh, person marketing to consumers, or whether you're trying to orchestrate an infrastructure alliance to get this stuff done, um, one of these two models, or both of them working together is what matters. So, okay, so the first model is the crossing the chasm model. This is a model that Everett Rogers introduced, the original version, oh, seven decades ago. He made a very simple claim. If you introduce a disruptive innovation into any community, the community will self-segregate into five different strategies for dealing with the disruption. So there's the strategy of the innovator, who tends to get early and embrace and buy one early, my friend John Metcalf has had a Nissan Leaf for I don't know how long, but he has number 329. He would be an innovator, right? The next group are the early adopters. They aren't necessarily innovators. They don't necessarily like the object per se, but they like the fact that it could have an incredible impact on something. And so what they're looking to do is to create a competitive advantage or a dramatic change in, in, you know, in the carbon footprint of Palo Alto or, or the sustainability uh, business of SAP or Google or, or, or whatever going forward getting ahead of the curve. Then we come to the two most popular strategies. The pragmatist strategy, which is, sounds interesting. I'm sure it's going to happen someday. 
uh, I'll do it when you do it, okay? So, and pragmatists like to come to things like this and say, so, uh, actually this is a little bit more visionary than the average group. But in, in the pragmatist community, people go, Are you, do you have one yet? Yeah, no, no not yet, no. Me neither, they're just checking, just checking, okay. And, and that's what I want. Or, or it's like, you do, you do, you do, the whole neighborhood? Oh, okay, I'll get one now. Okay, so that's the pragmatist strategy. The conservative strategy is, mm, yeah, no, I'm not very good with this stuff. I, I'll, could I just stay with what I have? I'm much more comfortable with that. And then the library to think that most technology is an instrument of the devil. <laughs> and, and all five of these strategies are legit, but here's what happens. Inevitably, the first two constituencies kind of secede from the, from the community and go ahead of the herd. And, and arguably, a lot of the behavior we've been celebrating this morning is about that. It's about individuals making personal decisions, and it's about lead, leading institutions like SAP and Google and others who are making institutional decisions in the city of Palo Alto, et cetera, and the airport at San Francisco and whatnot, and we're saying we're gonna get this fire started, and it creates something we call the early market. And then the chasm is the lagging period when the rest of the world says, well, that's very interesting for Silicon Valley, and aren't they kind of interesting in Silicon Valley? I'll watch the newscast from Silicon Valley, but I happen to live in Boise. You know, or I live in you know, Butte, Montana, or I live in St. Louis, and we're not, we're not them. So when are we going to do it? And that creates a really interesting issue where you realize innovations have to get started twice. You light the fire in the early market, it kind of flickers. It may not go out, but it certainly flickers in the chasm. And you've got to kind of relight the fire on the other side of the chasm. And it's a different set of value propositions that gets the pragmatist to buy in. And we'll, we'll take a look at that in just a minute. But in general, the early market, market buys in because it's a great, wonderful new opportunity. And pragmatists buy in because it solves a rather nasty problem, which is a very different value proposition. Once enough pragmatists get going, we get this the thing we ended up calling the tornado. That's when everybody says, oh, hell, let's just do it. It's cheaper, faster, better. What's your question? And the tornado and the chasm, if you think about it, are the same phenomenon. The chasm is the, is the herd going, polling itself and realizing we're not ready yet. And the tornado is the herd polling itself and saying stampede. Okay? And so that's where you get this incredibly jerky, this jerky market development that's very, it's, it's exhilarating to investors when they're in the tornado. It's totally depressing to them when they're in the chasm because they, they don't get why it's not more linear. Okay? But, it, but it isn't linear, it's, it, it's a kind of a, all on, all off a phenomenon. And then you get to Main Street. And Main Street is when you're buying your second or third or fourth or fifth electric vehicle, and it's like, okay, this is now an industry, and what's your question? So the key thing to remember about this, just from the point of view of a policymaker, whether you're a strategy maker in a company, or a member of the public policy community, or just an interested consumer, the way you play each of these four inflection points in the history of that adoption life cycle is very different. And so it's extremely important to figure out where are we now. So if we're in the early market, it's all about creating this dramatic competitive advantage of setting yourself apart. It's, a, it's typically done around projects. You, 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 the city of Palo Alto does a carbon footprint reduction project. It's not, it wasn't part of the normal thing two or three or four years ago. They introduced it. And you focus on performance. 53% carbon footprint reduced. And, and, the, and the cost of doing it, the fact, the cost to actually implement the project is not the issue. You'll probably do whatever it costs, you'll, you'll shape it to your budget, but the idea is how far can we just take this thing if we really just try to push the envelope? When it comes to crossing the chasm, and now we're really starting to begin to scale, the, the, the bowling alley is all about niche markets who have unique problems. Maybe it's a muni system with, with, with just the price of gasoline. Uh, it, certainly in China, they've adopted a lot of electric vehicles, and they've actually introduced a huge 3,000 volt capacitor uh, in, into their electronic vehicles, because that's solving a very particular problem for them. So that's a broken process problem. It could be taxis, it could be, it could be, it could be company fleets, it could be FedEx, it could be the post office, but it's gonna be somebody who says, you know, the carbon footprint solution for us is no longer working uh, within the constraints we're trying to operate. We need a solution. It could be fit specifically to our type of vehicle. It doesn't have to be for every vehicle. And we need performance, but we're on a budget. So it's performance, but with a thought toward price. So that's the second place. And you can develop these niche markets in advance of a mainstream market. 
because they're relatively self-contained and they kind of serve each other. So all the vehicles at an airport, for example, could convert to electric and you could play that game because you'd have all your charging centralized, et cetera. And your supply depot and all the, all the other things that you need for a complete solution. When you get to the tornado, it's all about, no, 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 no. This is now the better way to go. This really is about productivity. And in, 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 in the consumer sense, it's just about better experience for less money kind of stuff, less effort. It's a, now it is about the product, and, and, and it's all about price performance. And this is when you get these amazing uh, growth curves, and, and, and factories are on allocation, and, and, and you're, you're growing like crazy. And then you get to Main Street, and in Main Street now, it's like, okay, we need now to expand the product line from all the way to the top. We can't just have roadsters and, you know, and this gorgeous test, so we gotta have some entry-level vehicles here, guys. And, and we need to have a systems orientation, which means, you know, it's not just the charging station. You know, spare parts, repairs, uh, is there, I don't, do you have to change driver's education? You know, whatever, it, you have to think about it end to end to end as to what is the complete system here going on. And that will, that will actually take multiple years of us discovering glitches and then repairing them and, and, and going forward. And there the, 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 the focus is on price and total cost of ownership. So the point about this diagram, every one of those icons is one you've kind of seen before. The issue is which one are you playing today? Because you don't want to do a blend across them. They're kind of, they're not mutually exclusive completely, but at the margin, but at the center points they are. And so you want to figure out which is the right play to play. So to do that, you kind of have to ask yourself, where are we in the great scheme of things? And so the technology adoption life cycle lives at the beginning of something we call the category maturity life cycle. There's a time when there's going to be wonderful growth. Probably that's, in, in the, that's the, the, the last three innings that Mike was referring to, and maybe the next five innings after that. S at some point, it will, grow, it, it will level off. We'll say, okay, we've, we've sort of caught that first wave of transition from carbon-based to electric. Carbon probably will not go away, so it'll probably reach some sort of balance. And then we'll have a prolonged period we call the indefinitely elastic middle. The carbon-based vehicles are in their eighth decade of being in C. But I think the hope of the EV industry and the hope of environmentalists is that we can push them into D. That in fact we could actually move the carbon-based vehicles toward, toward a place where they're going to become more of the exception instead of the rule. I don't think that's going to happen any near-term thing, but I think it's a long-term public policy outcome. And eventually you could have a time where it's like, I'm sorry, it's like film and cameras, a Kodak moment. You know, we just, we don't, we don't drive these things anymore, okay? Uh, going forward, the way, the way certain kinds of gasoline aren't, aren't used anymore. So the, the issue here is, if you're in the industry, how do you play this game when you have a stake in both ends? How do you play this game as Nissan? How do you play this game as Chevrolet? You know, or Toyota, or whomever? Where does the hybrid play in this role, right? I mean, there's a whole bunch of questions you would want to ask here. And, and so different people, if you're playing a hybrid game versus a pure EV game versus a, you know, a, a, a lagging game with non-EV type stuff, the question you want to ask yourself is where for the community that we are going to address do we think this disruptive innovation is in the life cycle? And, and so I just want to give you the, the, the litmus test. So how do you tell? And I'll kind of do it from back to front. If EVs were on Main Street, there would be an established marking pet market pecking order. The order of magnitude would begin to approximate carbon things, so we would be selling millions and probably at some point leaning toward five to eight to 10 million, but let's say one to five million, and there'd be a clear market leader, okay? Uh, the way that the, the automobile industry has had a classic set of tier ones, tier two, tier three brands, okay? So you say, uh, is EV there yet? And you think, probably not. Is it in the tornado? Well, is there a major land grab underway right now displacing the, the old guard? If this were true when you drove into Menlo Park or when you drove into, into Burlingame or whatever, all the auto rows would have the EVs like just everywhere. It'd be in, it'd be in, every, be in every showroom and, and the, the, the papers would be, well, not the papers, got them so old fashioned, but the internet would be plastered with, 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 with deals, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I don't think we're there either. So are we in the bowling alley? Are there segments? So it's interesting. I, I, I'm not aware of them, but this is, I think, now we're getting into the area of, well, but maybe in, in certain geographies, in certain industries, I don't know. But what you'd be looking to say is, has any segment, either in an industry or a geography, whether that's a public sector or a private sector segment, 
kind of flipped the switch. And as a segment, re standardized on this stuff. Okay? My guess is not yet, except I do think public transportation in China, I don't know where that one is. It might be an interesting place to look. But that, that would be the question. Is it in the chasm? Well, are we having lots of seminars and conferences? That's, that's, that's usually the sign of something's in the chasm. It's, is this EV thing gonna play out? I'm not sure, okay? Or are we in the early market? Has a market darling emerged? Well, yes, a market darling has emerged uh, from about 500 yards from this building, right? And, and so we have a market darling that has a, has a market darling market cap um, right now. And so you say, okay, we're clearly, you know, and that's actual progress because, because a few years ago, well, when I, it's funny, I wrote the first version of Crossing the Chasm in 1990, and my example was an electric vehicle. Because at that time at HP, a few people had converted their cars to electric vehicles and they were plugging them in at work in, 19, in 1990. And, and then when I rewrote it in 1999 with new examples, I used the electric vehicle again. And at that time, I think, Either I think Chevy had just come out with their first electric vehicle, and, and Ford was looking, looking to do it. So, so this is actually very significantly different. This now feels like we have a, a significant, and it doesn't feel like this one's going to stop. I don't think the question now is, you think this EV thing's going to happen? I, mean, I think the issue is we've seen the future. The only question is, what year is it? Right? You know, says, when you, this is the thing about visionaries, by the way. They see the future, they forget to look at the calendar. If you just look at the calendar and tell me what year it was, I'd be fine. Right? So that's, that's how we're going to sort this thing out. So that's sort of the classic chasm model. I think you want to keep that in your mind. If you're an investor, whether public or private, how do I take, make my bets and play the game? So the four success factors you're going to worry about is if I'm crossing the chasm in particular, so if I think I'm early market crossing the chasm, who's my target customer? I hope they have money and I hope I have good access to them. Are they a pragmatist in pain, able to buy in bulk? Now remember, this is the institutional customer. We'll worry about the consumer on the next one. This is, who do I need institutional help from? Do they have a broken mission critical process that will cause them to go, kind of go all in ahead of the herd because this solves a very important problem for them? And I'd like to take us from 100,000 to a million, right? In other words, a million to 10 million is the consumer journey, but 100,000 to a million, we might be able to get there on the back of just a few really strong commitments from, some, from niche markets. At least it's a, it's a possible strategy. What you would need to provide these niche markets is a complete end-to-end -end solution that works extremely well for their environment, and they go, yeah, this is, this is great, we're gonna do this. And you would like, ideally, it not to be some niche that is so weird and so rarefied and so isolated that no other niche would ever be able to leverage the work. You'd like to take it you know, from FedEx to the post office or from you know, the post office to the taxi business or from the taxi business to the shovel business or, 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 or whatever it would be. But that would be how you'd play the game. It's a known game to play. A lot of people in Silicon Valley know how to play that game. Just remember to play it, okay? Okay. So that, so, so, and the question we might ask and we have here is, does, do people have ideas about, are there segments that you think are ripe for picking that could take us from 100,000 to a million vehicles? Or not one segment, but a, a series of segments. Okay, that's the model for crossing the chasm. Been around for now 25 years about. It's had a lot of success, particularly B2B orientation. What happened, as I said, with the, with the rise of the web and, and Google and Facebook and, and, and Twitter and, and YouTube and, and all this stuff, is a second model has come into our consciousness where it is, it's, it's easy for the consumer to kind of get into the game with relatively low friction. That's not exactly the map we have here, but it, this is a model which, we, we, which we, we're gonna ask ourselves today and in the future, how much of this model can we use for EVs? So the model says, in a, in a consumer-oriented thing where you go from the bottom up instead of the top down, the first challenge is can you just acquire, can you acquire new users? Can you acquire people to at least test and, and experiment and try, okay? Obviously on the internet, that's, that's not, that's not a, a very expensive thing to do. With something like an EV, it's more expensive, but can we get, the, can we, can we get people at the top of the funnel, if you will? If we can, can we engage them? Can we get them in involved enough that they begin to come back, that they begin to care, that they begin to develop the passion, that they're gonna develop a commitment? If, can we get even a few of them to be enlisted? Now, enlisted means they become an evangelist. 
not only do they personally get a lot out of the experience, they actually go and proselytize on your behalf. They, they, and you, you know, we've all met them. Uh, <laughs> and, and, and you'll sit next to them at a dinner party, for example. Uh, it could be a long party, depending on what they're evangelizing. But the point is they care a ton, right? And they will talk your ear off about it. And that's a key to the adoption thing. And then at some point, you have to figure out, OK, and can we monetize this thing in a way that makes sense for all the constituents? Can we make the money work? But what's really interesting about this model is that's the last one you bring in. Whereas in the chasm model, it's a pay-as-you-go model. This is a model where you actually work the adoption cycles and try to get the, the momentum. And I'll kind of show you how that plays out. So what you try to do, first thing you do is you say, look, take monetization off the table for the, for the time being. Just ignore. Put in place some entrepreneurial agent. Think of them as a starter motor and have them start running experiments in acquisition. And can they run experiments in engagement? Some of you are signing up for one. And uh, can they run experiments in enlistment? Can they get some blog things going? If the enlistment's going, maybe that can get the acquisition thing going. Maybe we can get the engagement thing going. And now we can start thinking about, can we get the monetization gear just moving? Can we get this thing moving? And if we can get it moving, can we start to speed it up? Is there some ways we can do to continually kind of prime the pump? Think about like a merry-go-round. And what we're trying to do is spin this thing up until we get a tornado, right? Welcome to Instagram, right? <laughs> or Tumblr, or, 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 or whatever. OK, so that's the idea. So in that model, if you say, OK, wow, uh, seems like a great way to make a billion dollars. How, how, how can we do this, right? Um, so as you look at this model, what we've decided is you need to distinguish between two sets of gears. The gears that are acquisition and monetization are the gears that a financial investor would measure. That, the, that a skeptical person would measure. They'd say, okay, so how many people are actually uh, trying this thing? And frankly, how many of these people are paying for it in any meaningful way? So how many vehicles are on the road? And how many owners do we have? And do we have more owners than vehicles or more vehicles than owners, right? So that, that, that's the acquisition side. And then on the monetization side, how much revenue is coming out of this industry right now, just as a, as a whole? And, and then how much ARPU downstream is, is, is you know, right now we're, we're actually, you know, um, Mike actually is getting paid to go to the, to go to the, uh, uh, to the airport. Well, how will that monetization system end up playing out? What is the business model that will make this work? We've talked a lot. The phrase business model has come hugely into the ascendancy because of this issue of deferred monetization and how do you, how do you play it out in a post-adoption scenario as opposed to trying to monetize as you go along. These are the performance gears. Okay. They, they sort of, they kind of are the rear view mirror of adoption. Once these gears are moving, you can kind of say, we have adopted. The other two gears are actually the power gears. They're the gears that give you permission to monetize and permission to acquire. So engagement is all about, so when people try this stuff, how many miles are they driving? Do they buy an EV and then just park it in their garage? Or how, what percentage of their total vehicle time is in an EV versus, say, a non-EV, for example? What percentage of their total miles is going forward? In terms of enlistment, how much social media, how much buzz is there creating there? How much is there a, 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 a movement where it turns out 1% or 2% of the people in a, in a community are the thought leaders that kind of lead and, 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 and inspire the other 98% who are more lurkers? It's kind of like on Facebook, same kind of thing. Um, and so how many referrals? How's that working? And so when you're playing this game as a, as a consumer-oriented marketeer, and again, or a public citizen-oriented policymaker, the thesis of the gear model is prior to the tornado, one of those gears is slowing the other three down. And if that's true, then the idea would be, why don't we identify that slowest gear and focus the next Typically on the web, it's the next 90 days on what could we do to speed up that gear and then maintain attention on the other three gears. You can't ignore the other three, but at the, at the margin, you're putting your marginal attention on the other three. Repeat every quarter until a tornado happens or you run out of, not gas, you run out of battery life, right? I mean, come on, it's an EV. But, but, but the idea there would be, if you look at this model, then you say, okay, so what, what's the slowest gear for consumer adoption right now? Is it, is, it that, is it that we can't get enough people to try it? Is it they try it, but they don't use it? Is it that these things are too expensive? Is it that there's, there's just not a groundswell in support of it? In Palo Alto area, I would argue 
the bottom gears actually are not the concern right now. I think it's an acquisition problem here. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what it might be in, in other communities, but there's a lot of enlistment. Um, I think the engagement acquisition engagement gears might be the most interesting gears to focus on right now, because I, I do wonder if people are getting the full experience for, for, from the EV, and if they're not, will that create enough engagement and enlistment to get the thing going? So just to kind of, it's a little bit like a, a spiritual movement, getting things getting things moving uh, at this point. So just to put the list of the last slide, just to sort of put this in perspective. I think you have to play a pincer, a pincer movement here. And I think, I think any institution in the room should have a major and a minor in these two methods of market development. And you should declare your major, just like you would as an undergraduate. So, so some of you should declare for, we're gonna take a B2B path, and we're gonna look to our partners for B2C support. And some of you should say, no, we're taking a B2C path, and we're looking to our partners for B2B support. But the B2B support will be, look, this is a top-down approach. You literally go to individuals at the top of institutions, whether they are elected officials in communities, whether they are sustainability executives in large corporations, uh, whether they are logistic executives in transportation and logistics organizations. You go to individual decision-making bodies who can move hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars into the system, perhaps tens of millions, and I guess in the terms of public policy, hundreds of millions potentially, into the system in order to meet uh, infrastructure needs, and particularly around niche markets, because, because that, will, that will reduce the budget for the initial deployment. And what you want to do in these, is crossing the chasm, is you want to have a big impact in a relatively limited space in a very limited amount of time, which is kind of the way you start the fire on the other side of the chasm, and then you get it going. So it's a direct sales to economic buyers. It's a pay-as-you-go model. In fact, you don't discount. You actually may even pay a premium because you're solving a problem. The reason why they're, they're coming with you now is because they actually are spending a lot of money in a bad place that they would like to, to repurpose in a, in a good place. And the biggest risk in this approach, and it has happened with other technologies, is you get stuck in a niche. You actually succeed in crossing the chasm, and then you can't get out of your first niche. You're just, you're just kind of there forever. Okay, so that, which is which, which is, is one risk. The consumer play is a very different play. It's, we're not going to do the, the core niche crossing the chasm idea. First of all, it's a bottom-up approach. So it's a grassroots approach. It's the Obama campaign coming from the bottom, right, and orchestrating it from the bottom, which had enormous impact, as we know, in the last election. Land and expand and targeting end users. So land and expand, catch those early adopters, see if you can't get them engaged, and then see if you can't get them enlisted so that they can begin to spread the word to, to, to the less, the less enthusiast, the less, uh, more reluctant adopters. It's a viral adoption play with digital communities. And the thing that's changed the game, the reason why this model is now viable and it wasn't viable 20 years ago, is digital communities. The fact that we now lead digitally mediated lives has changed the dynamics of marketing that make this grassroots phenomenon much, much, much more powerful. Again, the, the, the most recent election being just a huge example of how much power there is there. You become, in this game, you become profitable late in the game, and so the biggest risk here is actually that you run out of money, that, 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 you, that you, you play this game and you don't get to enough adoption dynamics to bring on the monetization gear fast enough and so you, you, put it, you put yourself at risk. So what we thought we might do is spend some time, might have come back up here and spend some time saying, okay, those are the two models. What do we think our ideas are? What do we think your ideas are? And so, I, and Jessica, you're, you're holding up your, your, your card. If you have some questions you'd like to see asked here, please hand them in. And I might come back up and we'll take some questions. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. get all of that. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, thank you. That was incredible. Well, thank you. Appreciate that. So uh, we just really wanted to say this group of esteemed people is not really in here to, for their own business interests of EV or policy. They've just pretty much been amassed so that you can finally be right about your writings <laughs> and that EV can finally be a disruptive innovation. Let's go. <laughs> so um, back in 2010, I have about a thousand vehicles, so order of magnitude in the thousands. 2011, an order of magnitude in the tens of thousands. Uh, we just eclipsed our first 100,000 vehicle, so let's say between 20, 
13 and 14, we're into the hundreds of thousands. Now, the next order of magnitude is the millions. And maybe someone could predict, like you said, around 2020 or whatever that might be. But the stretch is between 100,000 and a million, and a million and 10 million. Now that might seem pretty easy for Instagram, but these are vehicles. So tell us whether this is possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it, it is the, the order of magnitude. It's so deceptive. It's just the difference between 10 to the fourth and 10 to the fifth and 10 to the sixth. What's your problem? <laughs> <laughs> this order of magnitude thing is tricky. What we've learned is that each order of magnitude is its own journey. So that the strategy that gets you from 10 to the third to 10 to the fourth is almost certainly not the strategy that gets you from 10 to the fourth to 10 to the fifth, which is almost certainly not the one that gets you from 10 to the fifth to 10 to the sixth. So I think, I think we're getting to 100,000, and I don't know if that's cumulative or annual. It's cumulative today, today but it'll be and annual. We'll say annually okay. between the end of the year or so. The, so the way you look at that, you say, it, 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 say somewhere in 2014, we're on a one, this is an adventure. Well, we're on a 100,000 run rate. That's the thing you say when your first quarter got to 25,000. Um, so you say, okay, uh, that's 1% roughly of the, of the, well, somewhere between a half and 1%. So I think most ecosystems, until you get to 1 to 2, two maybe 3%, there's enough elasticity in the ecosystem that it'll kind of let you play. And then all of a sudden you hit the first major resistance, which is, you know what, this is actually costing me now. And, and I'm not so sure. But now for the first time, I have to take this really seriously. And I think that there, that's why I think some version of a coordinated crossing the chasm strategy is gonna, with, with the consumer strategy is gonna be important. Because I think the person that can push it from, from that 100,000, even to 500,000, we just even got from 100 to 500, but I'm thinking closer to a million. That's the one where the infrastructure guys, I think, step up ahead of the game. And if they had some niche market support from a series of logistical systems Providers, whether they're public transportation or private transportation, um, that'd be great. Uh, I think that'd be great, and and I think the the one to ten journey is a consumer journey. Great. Um, so you know we. We see that the mayor said that there's so many vehicles in Palo Alto. We see these vehicles everywhere in Silicon Valley and, and in LA, and certainly California is the leader. That's no secret. Now things are happening in New York, uh, Texas, Florida, Chicago, the high population areas. And there certainly seems to be an exuberance ab about this year seeing all the Tesla Model S's out there. And there, there's certainly an energy behind this business, right? It's on its way. We're on our third annual seminar, which may be a curse now. <laughs> so, uh, so what are the traps now? So everybody's exuberant, not everybody, but you no, could see no, the growth. What are the traps that we should be looking forward in the next couple yeah. of years? I think that the number one trap in this uh, industry forever, oh, thank you, Jessica, um, has always been to mistake the early market for the tornado. Because they kind of feel the same. You know, it's like, I mean, it's like everywhere, everywhere you drive, who is, you know, uh, there's a Tesla everywhere I drive. We, we're in the tornado. No, you're not. You're in Palo Alto, right? <laughs> and, but it feels like a tornado, you know? And because and, and, everybody you talk to is like, oh, yeah, yeah, of course, of course, of course. And so I think, I think being, I think being, having the sort of humility to be able to step back and say, and, and the thing is, by the way, statistic, it's not that you need a statistical survey. You actually just need to kind of touch base with middle America and see where you guys, and also middle France, middle England. I mean, there's a couple other things that are going on at the same time. One is, it's not clear in Europe that kids want to drive cars, okay? Which, which is, for as an American, it's like, what? But that's number one. And number two, with our friends at Google, it's not clear you're going to drive a car anyway. <laughs> Just sit down and shut up. <laughs> so, I mean, so there's a lot of things going on. But, but I think in general, that would be the, my biggest concern would be, you, you're in the enthusiasm early market, you overinvest and you fall into the chasm and lose your money. Interesting. So you don't want to overinvest, you have to sort of invest with control. That would be my, that, uh, my bet would be to try to see if you could find some containable bet where you could create a dramatic, a dramatically, un, a, a never before seen, unprecedented dramatic outcome within a containable community. Great, I have a question that came in and said, Mike, you said uh, last year we were in the top of the second inning, where are we now? Well, if you look at, um, we're, we're actually in the top of the second inning again. So if you remember last year, I didn't use uh, 2011 as, uh, as the sort of zero year. And when I realized that we have to consider 2020 inclusive, the three three inning ball games actually started in the beginning of 2012 and will end in 2020, which is great. So we have a grace period of a year, we've done great, and we haven't moved. 
<laughs> so we really look at this as um, that the 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 um, as we progress, first half of the year is the top of the inning, bottom half of the year is the bottom, the second half of the, of the year is the bottom uh, of the inning. So, so let me push back at you. So, yeah, so I'll be your venture investor because it's like. I'm sorry. On our so now I have at least two. On our, on our venture accounting, I'm not sure I'm going to give you a year. Uh, so, so what is the milestone that you think somebody would fund the industry to that would say, this is the next meaningful milestone? This is the next meaningful milestone. I would say that we would have, and I think, I think we're actually closer than we think, 10% um, adoption rate at the workplace. You've got 1,000 people, and 100 of those people are saying, Where's, where can I charge? How come you're not allowing me to charge at work? I need to, dry, to charge at work. And, 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 and how many workplaces? Uh, that's a great question. I would say, uh, I'd say at least 50% of the workplaces, and it'd have to be geographically sort of favorable. Right. Well, well let's, let's pick the most favorable, which sure. would be here. Would be here. So if you said, if 10% if, if of the population at 50% of the workplaces were EV, you'd say, we think that's a, step, a real stepping stone that would let us raise more money. Because classically, what you do in venture is you want to hit a milestone that lets you raise more money at a higher valuation. Sure. That, that would be your bet, OK? That would be my bet. Okay. Great. So I have these um, sort of impediments to success, right? And I have a couple of questions here. I won't get to all of them. But you know, one of the questions is you know, the real challenge. If the price of gas went down to three dollars would, would be lights out. If fracking came to California, or if we were able to you know, ship all of our uh, gas at much more efficient rates, or if there was a sort of major energy step change, you know, would it be lights out for electric vehicles? Are we really just dependent on the price of oil here as, a, as, as the drivers of our business? What do you say to that? Well, you know, this is, I mean, clean, Venture got very excited about clean tech about 10 years ago. And clean tech has not been a good category for venture. And the reason is that venture is constructed around 10-year funding windows. So, uh, you raise a fund for a 10-year return. And what we've discovered about energy, the energy industry is, at least historically, it's on a two to three decade cycle, not a one decade cycle. And so I do think that there will be, um, I mean, the, 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 the industry will not, will not just sit here passively and not respond. This will, this will, there'll be a series of responses. I think that electric vehicle opportunity could, is going to, my belief is it will succeed or fail based at least as much on the quality of the drive and the quality of, and then the economics of, of the driving as, as much as it will on, you know, a, 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 the high price of oil. Because I, I do think we'll see, because then there's this natural gas, you know, resource. And so there's a lot of different ways to play the game. I, I get very nervous about price supports as anything other than an incubation tactic. Sure. So I look at it as, um, w when you see Tesla, that's a great example of a disruptive innovation. And you talk in some of your works in Crossing the Chasm, the difference between disruptive innovations and sustaining innovations. And we've also seen some response from the automotive manufacturers in the early going that took sustaining innovations and sort of converted them electric. Even, even the Chevy Volt in some way, right, it has some of the threads, even though it's sort of ground up. But certainly, some of the Ford products and some of the BMW products initially to test the market have been conversions in some ways. So the question I have for you is, 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 the, disruptive, is the success of a disruptive innovation have to be clearly different like Tesla? Or can companies really react starting with sustaining innovations and then converting to uh, more disruptive innovations like yeah. maybe BMW has shown? Yeah. And, and I don't know where the hybrid, where you'd put the hybrid in that world. The hybrid started as a relatively minor compromise. It feels to me, I, I, don't, I don't think Prius owners feel like they, they have the anxiety, any of the anxiety issues that, that, a, that an EV owner has. Uh, so can you get there or not? Um, typically what we found with disruptive innovations is if the innovation creates a 10x difference. That, that, that was what Andy Grove always used that to talk about. The yeah. 10x. Yeah, yeah. If you create a 10x difference, then the advantage is to go all in on the new. If, if, in fact, you can't get to a 10x difference, if, in fact, it's a 2 to 4x difference, then I think the sustaining guys will eventually catch you. And so, so um, and I, 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 I mean, it, it's, it certainly kind of feels like Tesla's kind of made that 10x thing. At least that's certainly the, the spirit of Tesla. Uh, and and, and we'll, I think we'll sort of see that play out. But if it's not true, at the end of the day, it's going to be a real value change or not. 
And most of the world, that's why the private just heard weights, because they want to find out, is it, is it a hype or is it really a step function change? If it's a step function change, I'll buy in eventually. And if it's hype, I'm kind of glad I didn't. Sure. Yeah. So, so we see um, other impediments to success, right? Because ultimately, we have to break through these barriers. And there's, and there's plenty of them in the early going here. One of the sort of submers or subversive ones is that dealers of gas-powered vehicles are really not too sure about how to manage this new EV. This is disruption, right? right. And dealers make money on oil filter changes and maintenance, et cetera. So the question is, and maybe you could share some previous models where you've seen this happen, where there's a very quiet push back, and we're all exuberant up at the top, but th this is a very powerful force. Right. So maybe you can share some examples and what we should expect, and, and, and do they eventually dealers just die, or is it something that gets harmonized eventually? Well, or do you die? I mean, yeah, so, or so, do we die, so, exactly. So, so uh, Richard, uh, Richard Pope's in the front here. We know each other a long time back. So the next computer, so when Steve Jobs left Apple the first time, he founded something called Next Computer. And it was this incredibly black, sleek workstation thing, and it had this way cool small talk-like interface, and it was a library, and app stores before we had app stores, it had everything. And Computerland, which at the time was the big uh, uh, tech distributor, said we're going, to put, we're going to distribute this in every store in our, in our, in our entire uh, 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 portfolio, which is like 400 stores. So they got 400 Next computers, and they put them in the very, very far back of the store. And they put a sign in the front saying, we have Next computer. So the idea was you would walk from the front of the store all the way to the back of the store to see the Next computer, which you would not buy but you would look at and ooh and ah over, and then on your way back out, you'd buy things from Computerland, okay? So that was this example of the distributor in a way passively, aggressively actually defeating Steve's purposes while at the same time appearing to, to, to support them. I, I, I do think, you know, you, when you gore people's oxes, I remember when it was the Celex versus the Ilex, the competitive local exchange character carriers against the incumbent local exchange carriers. And we thought the Silicon Valley said the Celex are just going to kick their butts. And, and the answer is eventually, that's probably true, the over the top model. But in the short term, the ILEX said no, and they used regulation, and they used political clout and lobbying and a lot of other things to keep things. So inertia is a powerful force. Again, if you have a 10x value proposition and, and, and it, it truly resonates, then you overcome. But if it's a 2 to 4x, I think the incumbents have enough time to co-opt you. And, and what about in the 10x uh, world, particularly for the charging station industry, and, and where those business models might be that are really the drivers. Because you know, it's been known that the, you know, the return on investment, if you're wanting to sell energy, is, is maybe you know, seven years or do the math. And, but that's not what it's all about. It's about the innovative business models. It's about it's vouchering and employee retention. So the question is, how do you model that? Because we're sort of in very new ground. How do you model that? And whether you really have that blockbuster or not, yeah. uh, let's say, for those who want to raise money in that field. Yeah. And, and, and this is why it's venture risk. I, I think if you say, look, is there, let's think about something like Wi-Fi in a hotel. I mean, that's one where, I mean, there was a time when we charged for Wi-Fi, right? And, you, and still, if you go to high end, it's funny, the higher end of the hotel, the more likely it is they're going to charge you for Wi-Fi. Because uh, they're still stuck in their old model. And we pay it, right? But, but, because but, we need it quickly. But, but the new model is you don't charge for Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi is, right? I think, I think the intent of the electric vehicle model is to play that. So in that model, you're taking money out of one place in the value chain because you don't s sell electricity to your point. is That's not going to be the economic model. So then what is the economic model and, and, and where will it be? And the, you know, the electric vehicle certainly seems like the next screen. And so you start thinking, well, maybe it's some version of an internet business model, a content-oriented uh, model. The, the, can you collect data and repurpose the data? I mean, all the classic sort of dot-com ideas we had 15 years ago, they're all going to replay again here. Um, I think there's, there's a level, we learned a lot, that a lot of those dot-com ideas just didn't work. Mm. And so I think there's some feeling, well, let's be a little more careful this time out. How much luck is involved? Well, I... What's your philosophy on luck? Timing, luck. Yeah, I mean, for any individual, yes. But, but for the event to happen or not, I think the 10x factor is, is, it makes its own luck. And the, and the bad luck is when you really don't own up to the fact that you don't have a 10x factor. Ah, so you wake up to the reality that the idea wasn't as good as you thought. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, you spoke about policy and government in a, in a prior example. Uh, th th this industry is sort of riddled with policy and government in very positive ways. Right? There's a lot, of, a lot of folks here have a vested interest in moving this forward and, and, and sort of uh, tapping into government uh, entities, tapping into local uh, communities, tapping into air quality management and, and, and climate related uh, governments. How typically is important the way you see, uh, and you don't have to use EV, but no, no, wait, uh, important, of, you know, the government side to get that all right. Maybe she could share some examples well, there. Well, I, I think there's two, th I think it's extremely important at, at, that public, I mean, public policy can have a huge impact. We saw the impact it had on solar in Germany. We see the impact it's had in, in Texas with unregulated utilities in, in, in New Jersey and California, wh whatever. I think the, the salient issue that's come to the fore in the last five years is can the government afford to be a social agent? Mm. Does it have, the, does it have the, the coffers? So I actually think that the state of the economy, I think if the state of the economy is relatively positive, I think that sustainability as a, set of, as a social issue is, wants to get funded. I don't think it, it however, I think, I think people are more frightened of crime, losing their job, and war than they are of, of, of carbon emissions. And so right now it's in that second tier. And so as a second tier, it, it, it's, it's can, the, can the society f afford to fund its second tier initiatives? And is it going to be the private sector or the public sector? I would prefer to make it in the private sector and say, look, let's just spend our discretionary money on the vehicles we want to drive. Sure. And do you have to pretty much measure? Should you measure the business on its own and, and say, look, you know, without government funding, does this have legs? Does this go 10x? And is that that's really what? What's your thought? I kind of think so because I think I think for at least the rest of this decade, we we so abused our financial system in 2008. I mean, it wasn't in that year. It was a, an, about an eight-year run of abuse that it's probably going to take eight years to dig our way out from under. I mean, it's just order of magnitude. So we're still we still got three or four more years, I think, of just trying to get the economy out of the abuse cycle and back onto a reasonable footing. And, and during that period, it's very hard for public coffers to fund discretionary uh, uh, opportunities. Sure, at the same time though, you know, the, the, the concept of jump-starting, right? If, if we had zero government money, would the electric vehicle, would all of what it means, and all it can change? You know, in, in some way, uh, Shia Gassi got it right when it came to the trillion dollar problem, right? So if, if there wasn't initial government funding, to get those things going. And remember, the VCs went in hiding, right? Oh, and you bet. That's key, right? Oh, you bet. And the VCs came back, clean tech or not, successful or not, when government finally was their partner in investment. And you know, that, that's a point I'll, I'll sort of make, make clear as a capitalist, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so the question is, do you, uh, do you see that the jump-starting mechanism is, is effective and then eventually it has to sustain? Well, well let, me do, let me do it slightly differently. If you look at this entire valley, it was jump-started on the defense industry and on the space program. I mean, yeah. fundamentally, so it was federal spending. Sure. And, and, and when people worry about federal lack of, of, of social, of federal or government commitment to R&D, we say, look, I mean, this is, this is how we got here. So, I mean, I would, this is why I'm, I would try to, you know, I wonder if there's some place to tap into dollars that are going to be spent anyway and, and be able to have them spent in support of an EV uh, out outcome as opposed to some other outcome. Do you think the VCs are waking up that, you know, EV, is it clean tech? I mean, in some way, you know, clean tech went down with, you know, the, the sort of debacle around Solyndra and its perspective or perceptions, frankly. Do you think that there's uh, VCs that are looking at this industry as a technology industry the way they should with all its, uh, with, with all its wireless, with all the software, with all its cloud model? Yeah, so I think that the V, I think the VC industry is saying, look, we need to make investments that can yield VC returns in a 10-year period. So that, that's, so that's still a 10-year period. Yeah, because that's how you raise Build funds. a billion, billion that's, dollars. That's what, right. limit, that's what limited partners give you the money for. Yeah. So, so in that model, you have to say, but, but if you say, to the degree I'm going to get a return through some sort of digital IT-oriented thing, I think the, the value is, you had them from hello. There's zero resistance to, to making those investments. I think the issue around, if I had to go to the other end of the spectrum, an alternative to oil, electrons as an alternative to oil, that's probably outside any window that's going to work right for a VC. Uh, and then so you have to say, well, where's an electric vehicle? And to what degree is an information appliance? Feels very VC-like. To what degree is it an alternative to oil? Doesn't feel so VC-like. And it's not clear right now that you need, that venture is going to be the key to the next five years anyway. It feels like, it feels like other forms of capital it doesn't feel like we're that we're so novel anymore that you necessarily could only attract venture capital. Right, and, and I think that brings up a good point. You know, we talked about disruptive innovations 
and, and classically, they take longer than originally anticipated, right? You look at the market analysts on the EV business, it's, which is why the nine-year ballgame uh, works, because there's so much exuberance about the growth of the EV industry. And I, I think I remember saying, I think it was last year here, somebody said, but Mike, how, you know, how come we haven't experienced the hockey stick growth? And I said, well, you need this, the handle first before <laughs> you get to the stick, right? And so you wonder that if, if VCs are going to invest, they want a quicker return. And here's part of the, that dilemma, right? Because they can't, in this business, and there's lots of different facets to the business, right? Uh, the waiting period is often too long for the VC right. horizon. Right. And then the large companies, you know, who, who are invested in for the long haul. They have the deep pockets, if you will. Uh, they can invest for the long haul, but they can't fire up those innovative startups quick enough internally to innovate. So how do you... Well, and I, and I, would, argue, I would argue that getting to the 100,000 vehicle run rate, that was the job of the venture capital community. I would argue getting from a million to 10, that's the job of the industry, the conventional industry. And the anxiety one is getting from 100,000 to a million. And, and that's where we're going to have to find creative strategies because neither institution, it, that's not the sweet spot for either institution. That's great. So th is that, in a sense, what we would call the deepest chasm right yeah, there? I think Between so. 100,000 and I a think, million. I think well, we're still, you know, Gardner has a hype cycle. If yeah, Gardner were yeah. doing this on the sure. hype cycle, sure. you know, the Tesla valuation, is, you know, whatever it would be, it's like when NASDAQ was at 5,000, right? You know, that was sort of the, the, the height of that moment. And, and I, I think you have to expect that there's going to be a falling off. And then, and, and, and then a, a, and the, the issue is not that it's going to happen, it's how do I foreshorten that period? Uh, because it is going to happen. And, and, and rather than get discouraged by that, just say, look, you know, your kid goes through adolescence. It's, it's not the best period in their life, right? How do you foreshorten it? <laughs> so you can be, you're happy on either side, but it's like that moment in the tunnel where it's like, hello, hello. Uh, but so there's a little bit of that with the development of markets. And so when you're in that period of where it's, 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 it's not a natural growth period, then, then, okay, so let's not waste a minute in that, in, the, in that period. So that's actually aligned with the, you know, that, so that's the big problem, right? Because we're facing that. We're not there yet, but I'd say we're facing that in the middle of the game, right? We're facing that between, say, 2014, when we do, let's say, 100,000 vehicles in a given year, and maybe the end of the decade when we can get to a million vehicles within a year. And that puts us in a situation where that EV willing time, when there is charging infrastructure out there and people are willing to make that bet and buy an EV, is going to be critical in sense for the success of this industry. So what I would want to do is to say, look, um, of the, of the journey from 100,000 to a million I'm going to say, I'll give you half a million you're going to, you're going to get through the, through the trajectory of consumers. I want to get the other half of a million from, I don't know, 20 sources, 20 buyers. And, and I want 20, these 20 rule. Yeah, 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 but I, I, I want 20 institutions to each say, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to sign up for whatever that, you know, happening to, to 25,000. I got to think, are there institutions? Is it the Army? Is it the post office? Is it FedEx? Is it, uh, is it public transportation? Who the hell is it? And, and go get them. Just go get them, because what they will do is they will fund a bunch of the infrastructure that, that the consumer cannot afford to fund and a dealer could never afford to fund. And maybe the public sector can't afford to fund, but they can afford to fund it. And, and say, you know, that, that's what I would try to orchestrate. So we'll empower the consumer, because we need that side of the equation, yep. and we'll focus on the top 20% or the biggest impactors on the B2B side. And who can buy in bulk, who can buy in bulk and can underwrite, uh, underwrite infrastructure economically, so that it makes sense for them. And that would be, uh, in, in some way, a pretty good game plan for success here. So I think, you know, we, we can uh, summarize this yeah. fantastic chat, but I have one, one last question to ask Jeff here. I think that this community uh, really appreciates the timing of, uh, a, of a, really a business icon, an industry leader, to help us navigate over the course of uh, between now and the end of the decade. But like I was going to say, so, so I now want to know, so have you test, drove, uh, test driven an EV yet? I'm the late adopter guy. All right, so he's <laughs> the late adopter I guy. don't think you're an instrument of the devil, but I'm kind of now, shaky. Now, we have this on our recording, yeah, yeah, yeah. which is perfect. Yeah. So he just said he's the late adopter on EV. 
Will you do a ride and drive, and will, will we get you in any one of these great vehicles that we have? Not today, but but if but if you if you pursue me, yes. Okay, so <laughs> within, so I will pursue him within two weeks, or let's say whenever it's convenient. So within let's say one month, he'll have his first test drive, and we'll go ahead and arrange that. And I would offer that it, it could be any of your companies. And so who wants to be the first to uh, have have Jeff test drive? And then we're going to see, and this is going to be a great experiment. Your classic late adopter yep. on vehicles. Yep. Are you an early adopter on anything else? Oh, yeah, ideas. <laughs> ideas. It's brilliant. I'm, I'm envious. Some forms of wine. <laughs> Some forms of wine. Excellent. So uh, I would say I'm flipped on that, on that agreement. So, so uh, we're going to test this now. So he's never even test uh, driven an EV. He's a classic late adopter. And uh, within a month, we'll get him into one and maybe even a few. And then we're going to see his opinion, uh, just his unbiased, objective view on what this experience was like, and then potentially what that might mean for the future. And uh, so with that, I want to thank uh, all the questions that came in. There were, there were great questions. I know we didn't get to all of them, and we can talk to, to these offline. I want to thank uh, everybody for, for listening in to a really candid and wonderful conversation from uh, Mr. Jeffrey Moore. So let's give Jeff a oh, hand. Thanks. Thank thanks. You. Thanks. Thanks.